Thank you, Catherine. Welcome, everybody. So our speaker today is Christian Gerhardt from the University of Freiberg in the east of Germany. Um, and he will talk about inverse magnetization problems motivated from geo geoscience. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's Freiberg, not Freiburg, so it's the Freiberg that nobody knows. Um, no, yes. Um, okay, so I will talk about um, some inverse problems in geoscience. So our, our group here is uh, located at the geoscience department, but we're somewhat in between geoscientific applications and mathematics. So we claim to do a bit of both. Um, and uh, yes, so my talk will not have that much to do with uh, geometric analysis, I guess. So it will probably be a quite a different talk from what you're used to in this kind of seminar. But anyways, I find it interesting to present uh, my stuff in maybe a bit of a different community and then we'll see what, uh, what comes out. So um, the work I will present is sort of joint work with Laurent Baracha, Shin Peng Wang and Alex Gegelis. Um, and I will just start with like a bit of geophysical background, why we do what we do. And then I will talk a bit uh, about the mathematical aspects. And at the end, I give some, some images of some of the uh, applications that we did. Um, okay, yes. So that's basically the, the outline. So before uh, I properly start, just really the, the background. So we are interested in magnetic fields in our group especially like planetary magnetic fields, earth magnetic field, and what we can say about uh, subsurface structures, stuff like that. So um, I guess everybody sort of knows the Maxwell's equations. So that's like whatever, what, what describes uh, um, the processes of magnetic and, and electric field of, of the earth. Although we are only uh, interested in certain particular aspects concerning the, the Earth's lithosphere and not the whole set of uh, Maxwell's equations. But depending on uh, what part of geoscience or what uh, part of geophysics you're interested in, that's the underlying equation. Um, now just one image that I show basically in every talk, which is uh, showing all the different components of the Earth's magnetic field and uh, sort of the problems arising with it. Um, so the data that we get is actual measurements of the magnetic field of the Earth, which can be collected at satellite orbit. At, oops. I just want to, which you collect at some sort of satellite orbit. So that's where we have the data, like outside of the Earth. And we want to say something what happens on the inside, at least uh, as far as possible. And there are essentially sort of three different communities in the geophysical science in, in this uh, geomagnetic area. So there are probably one community working on stuff that affects the Earth's core. So they are dealing with numerical simulation of um, hydrodynamic equations coupled with Maxwell's equations. So what happens in the liquid core? Then there are groups interested in magnetospheric stuff, ionospheric stuff, so solar driven processes of magnetic field. And what I will essentially be interested in, what I will talk about today, or the problems that I will talk about today, are essentially coming from inverting magnetic field data to magnetizations that live somewhat in the thin crust of the Earth or some other planet. So that's um, the motivation that, that we have for the stuff that we will be talking about in a bit. And just a general problem here in this uh, setup is that what we measure, or not we, but satellite or some other instruments measures the uh, superposition of all the three components. So one big problem in geomagnetism is separating these components in the first place, which is not what I will talk about today. I will just assume that the magnetic, magnetic field that we measure solely comes from magnetizations within the Earth's crust. So we assume to already have that we already got rid of all the other sources. We just have sources coming from the crust. So, okay, that's our motivation. Um, so, as I said, when we talk about uh, the Earth's crust, so we don't have ma very many temporal changes. So we basically deal with uh, the static Maxwell equations, 
which is just uh, this set of equations over here. So what we measure is the um, magnetic field, uh, magnetic flux B, and which is divergence free. And we have the curl of the magnetic uh, field H, which is what we measure plus some magnetization, which is localized in the, um, in the Earth's uh, crust. So just remember we measure magnetic field in some exterior, on some exterior surface, and we're interested essentially in recovering this magnetization from the measurements. So written in another way, um, oops. Okay, so here you can maybe see our setup more clearly. Um, we measure the field on this red surface, which I call, try to call sigma throughout this uh, talk. And we want to say something about magnetization within this region omega. So the equations up here essentially reduce to this set of Laplace equation. So we know the magnetic field B can be written as the gradient of some potential phi, which is harmonic in the outside. So uh, where we measure the magnetic field, um, the potential is harmonic. And inside the source area, we know that the Laplace of the potential has to be the di divergence of our magnetization M. So in our data is essentially the normal derivative of the potential or Mostly we'll be talking about directly data, but this is what we, what our data is, and this is what we would like to recover. And the question I will be talking about mostly in this talk is about uniqueness of this M. So what components of M can we actually reconstruct from knowing this F on the boundary? And not, 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 not the boundary, but some surface in the exterior of our source region. Um, and mostly I will be talking about this integral equation setup, which is just the same as up here, um, just the, the solution of this boundary value problem, but mostly or most of my arguments will be sort of for this integral equation. So we know the potential phi, that's what we know on some surface sigma, and we would like to say something about magnetization M within the source region omega. Um, and basically I will consider two setups. And the difference in the setups is that in the first case, I assume that um, the source region is just a surface. So my, my magnetization is concentrated on a, on a closed surface. And the second setup will be that my magnetization is assumed to be localized in a volumetric open domain. So being concentrated on a surface makes sense geophysically um, at least if you look at large scale studies, because the Earth's crust is comparatively thin um, compared to the entire Earth's diameter. So for large scale features, it's quite okay to do this uh, approximation of the crust by a surface. But locally, if you like into exploration geophysics, I want to say something about the depth of your magnetization, then you're in the second setup but you actually need to assume that you have some volumetric source domain. Um, okay, that's probably the two setups I will talk about. And um, I will start with this uh, surface uh, setup. Okay. So the general outline will be, so once we have this sort of geophysical motivation covered, um, I will talk essentially about three recent papers of ours the first one will be dealing with uniqueness on surfaces. So we assume that our magnetization is localized on a, on a surface and we have measurements outside that surface. So what can we say about this magnetization? The second one is, I call it data completion problem. It will become a bit clearer in a bit why I call it this way, but it's closely related to the, to the first uh, section. And then in the end, um, we will be talking about uniqueness issues for this volumetric setup. So we, have, we assume some depth in our magnetization, stuff like that. That will be the third part. And in the end, I just saw some figures from geophysical examples, which basically tell you that what geophysicists do is not care about the mathematics, but do something that produces nice pictures. And we are sort of try to consolidate that a bit by trying to uh, do some more theoretical aspects to understand what can actually be reconstructed and try to merge this with uh, some um, proper geophysical modeling. Okay, so this is the general outline. 
Um, what, I will, what I will generally need throughout this talk um, for all these uh, three subsections will be um, essentially two decompositions, which you're probably quite aware of. So the first one is uh, if we are in the volumetric case, so we assume L2 functions or L2 vector fields that are living in some open domain omega um, is the classical helmholtz hosch decomposition. So you have uh, a gradient of H10 functions, you have harmonic gradients, and you have uh, divergence free fields that are tangent on the boundary of the uh, domain omega. And if we are talking about surfaces, and I mentioned the Helmholtz decomposition, I essentially mean that a vector field on the surface is decomposed into a normal field and two tangent fields, one is divergence free and one is curl free. Um, okay, and then another decomposition that we need, which is just for the uh, surface case, is the Hardy-Hodge decomposition. So any L2 vector field on some sufficiently nice um, surface, the omega, partial omega, can be decomposed into a two Hardy spaces, which I denote by H plus H minus, and again, a, a divergence free vector field that's tangent to this surface. Um, and Hardy spaces are probably just as uh, most of you know, we consider harmonic gradients. So if I, if I mean this uh, sub index uh, plus means we consider harmonic gradients inside our open domain omega and take the trace to the boundary. So we actually need some additional condition, which I don't, didn't write down here to guarantee that these traces, these non-tangential traces exist, but just assume they exist. And that's what defines our Hardy space H plus. And we have Hardy spaces H minus, which is the trace of harmonic gradients um, in the exterior of our domain omega bar. So these are the, essentially the spaces that will come up throughout these talks. And those are all the three decompositions that we will need throughout this talk. Okay, and now we come to this actual first um, section on uniqueness issues. So we assume the setup I described before, we have some unknown source living on some surface partial omega, and we have measurements of the potential phi somewhere outside on a surface sigma. Um, so this d omega is just a Lipschitz surface. So it's a, the surface of a um, connected uh, Lipschitz uh, domain. Um, okay, so for the applications, we typically talk about spheres, but um, this at least this section holds for more general Lipschitz surfaces. And we look at what we're interested in is in decomposing the L2 vector fields on this surface into um, subsets that tell us something about uh, the null space of our magnetic potential operator. So one uh, set we call I, which is uh, the set of magnetizations essentially that produce no magnetic field or no magnetic potential inside omega. So the potential is zero inside our domain omega. Then we have a set O, which is consistent of those magnetizations that produce no magnetic potential outside of this region omega. And we have a set that we call D, which is uh, containing all those magnetizations that produce neither magnetic field inside nor outside of the domain. Uh, so no, 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 outside of the um, of the surface uh, partial, uh, partial omega. Okay, so and what, what, what one can show is that these three sets actually compose the direct sum of the uh, L2 vector fields on this, on this surface uh, partial omega. So um, the null spaces of our potential decompose our L2 functions um, according to where the potentials vanish. Um, Okay, and what holds in general is uh, that the space D, so the magnetizations that don't produce magnetic uh, potential anywhere, those are exactly the divergence-free tangential field, fields on, uh, on our surface 
partial omega. Okay. And then the next interesting thing is that uh, if we are in the case of a sphere, that is uh, our surface is really uh, just a sphere, then these uh, spaces I and O that uh, describe our corresponding null spaces of the potential actually coincide with the Hardy spaces. So the Hardy space H plus is in that case, um, the set of magnetizations that do not produce any magnetic field inside the region omega, the Hardy space H minus turns out to describe all magnetizations that do not produce <coughs> a magnetic field outside our surface the omega. And this equality holds if and only if uh, the surface if, if, if is a sphere. So in any other <coughs> case, um, the Hardy spaces do not coincide with the corresponding null spaces. But what does hold true is, um, even if we are in a general Lipschitz surface case, that the L2 space or the space of L2 vector fields decomposes into the Hardy space H plus and into the <coughs> um, spaces, oh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> And into the spaces O and D. So O is again the one that does not produce magnetizations outside. D is the one that does not that does not produce any magnetic field outside. D is the one that doesn't produce any magnetic field anywhere. And H plus is then essentially the orthogonal complement of the null space um, of the potential field um, on the outside. And <clears throat> the other way around, if we're looking at um, what happens in the inside of the dom domain, we can decompose the L2 vector fields on the surface in terms of the null spaces D and I. And orthogonal to this, we have the uh, Hardy space H minus. So the Hardy spaces H plus minus essentially describe which components of the magnetization can be reconstructed. So um, if we have measurements, as typically is the case for, for the Earth, outside of the Earth, then we can only reconstruct the projection of magnetization onto the space H plus. If we were able to also measure inside the Earth, we would also be able to um, reconstruct the magnetizations projected onto the spaces H minus. Um, However, as I said before, if we don't have a sphere, if we just have any Lipschitz surface, then um, these H plus spaces do not coincide with the um, null space I, and the H minus space does not coincide with the null space O. But this relation over here with the this orthogonal decomposition holds still for, for any surface. Okay. Now briefly a motivation why this is. Um, uh, just let me think. So actually, I mean, without going into the details. Uh, okay, somehow I don't have the pen option in Zoom. Okay, anyways, um, not a problem. Then you just maybe have to believe me or ask a question if you want to know anything. Maybe it's because of the presentation mode. Ah, oh, that might be. Oops. Maybe. Okay, then last, uh, just let me try to do some writing in here. And then I switch back to the presentation mode. Um, so all we need is essentially to denote a certain set of operators. And once we have them, um, it drops out more or less directly, at least the general idea. Um, and this is um, 
fairly easy in the sense we look at the potential of some vector field F, which we know looks like this gradient of our fundamental solution of the Laplacian. And uh, let's say we are now in the outside. So our sigma is somewhere in the complement of our uh, domain omega c. So we measure outside our surface the omega. If we now take the trace from the uh, outside to the boundary the omega, we end up with the operators um, a plus one half acting on the normal component of our vector field F plus uh, the surface gradient and the single layer potential S, the adjoint operator, which is essentially formally the single layer of the uh, surface divergence of the tangential component of our vector field T. So this is the operator that describes the trace of the potential. So if anything is in the null space of this potential in the outside, it's automatically in the null space of this operator bi. Uh, sorry, um, this should be in the null space on the, on the inside. So if it's in the null space within omega, otherwise we get a minus in here, but that doesn't matter. Um, so the null space of this operator that acts only on the surface, the omega, is equivalent to the null space of the potential. Okay. So this operator bi is essentially all we, we need to do what we want to do. Um, and then the adjoint of this operator is then exactly the operator uh, on the next slide. So the adjoint of this operator bi is the normal vector on the, on the surface, the adjoint of the operator k which uh, I should have said is the double layer potential um, plus the surface gradient of S, which is the single layer potential on the surface. Um, and actually one can show that the range of these uh, joint operators is, are exactly the corresponding Hardy spaces. So if we take the trace from the inside, we get uh, this corresponds to looking at this operator bi star and the range is exactly the Hardy space H minus. And since the null space of this operator coincides with the corresponding null space of the potential, we direct, directly end up with this relation up here. Because by definition, I and D are the null spaces of the magnetic potential inside the domain omega. And uh, since uh, H minus is the range of the adjoint operator, we automatically get this relation. And the same we can do for, for taking the traces from the, from the outside. Okay, so I just switched back to uh, presentation mode and then go back to the other mode if I would need to do some drawing again. So I hope the general idea is, I mean, that, that is quite clear um, why this only works um, why this one here works in general. Oh, no, it does work. I don't know why. Um, why this one here holds in general is just because of these considerations. Why this one here holds only for the sphere is um, actually related to the fact that the double layer potential is self adjoint if and only if. Uh, the surface is a sphere, that's some result of this Mitrea paper from some years ago. Um, and these double air potentials are self adjoint if and only if uh, these operators bi star and bo star are orthogonal to each other. So um, we essentially just used these old results to, to come up with this. So, but the technical stuff has essentially been done in these Mitrea papers. Um, but at least for us, it was quite interesting that this uh, holds only on the surface of the sphere, while this result and um, the general direct sum over here holds for, for any Lipschitz surface. Okay. Um, so in the end now, 
what we at least get from this uh, first bit is that the Hardy spaces describe the components of the organization that we can actually reconstruct uniquely, while um, the, the null spaces are described by this I and O and uh, D spaces. Okay, so in the end for, for our applications, it's now sufficient to look only, only at the Hardy spaces, even if we're not on the circle surface, because they describe um, what we can uh, obtain uniquely from measurements outside or inside. Okay, so as I said before, the typical setup for us would be we have satellite measurements, so we have measurements outside the Earth or some other planet. Um, and the results from before tell us we can only recover the um, H plus component of our magnetization. Um, however, sometimes it makes sense to assume that, that, that magnetization is sort of localized somewhere on the surface. So if you look at craters on, on Mars, or if you look at uh, magnetizations only living on continents, you know that they're sort of like localized in subdomains of your um, surface, the omega. And in that case, simply because you can now harmonically continue your potential from the outside where you can measure it to the inside, um, you can uniquely um, reconstruct your H plus as well as your H minus component from magnetic field data outside the source region. So this assumption of spatial localization is quite, quite interesting because you can get more information on your, on your magnetization. Um, and this one holds again for, for general surfaces. Um, because in that case, the H plus H minus spaces still describe the orthogonal complement of the null spaces. Okay. But what you are missing is still this divergence free part. So you cannot reconstruct the anti magnetization, even if you have localization assumptions, but you can only reconstruct the hardy components of your function. Um, but um, sometimes you have uh, additional geophysical assumptions which is quite common is that you assume your magnetization to be of induced type. So it's not just that your magnetization is a vector field, but you know that it's sort of composed of a scalar valued uh, susceptibility, which I call chi, which we don't know. And you have some inducing field, which I now call BD. So which could be the uh, magnetic field uh, produced inside the Earth's core. And this main field, um, induces magnetizations inside the crust by aligning sort of tiny dipoles in the rocks with this main magnetic field. So you induce a secondary magnetic field and that's the crustal field. So it makes sometimes under some conditions sense to make this assumption that um, you know your inducing field, which comes from the core, which for which there are sort of models. So you know this vector field BD and you only want to reconstruct this scalar susceptibility chi. And um, from the results above, you actually that tell you, um, if you now assume that your susceptibility is spatially localized, you can get from these results up here that you can uniquely reconstruct your susceptibility under this additional assumption that you know the inducing vector field BD. Um, this assumption here can be made a bit weaker. So sometimes you assume this to be a dipole field. So you know that this BD is of the form X times D minus D X squared, something like this. And this D describes the direction of the dipole inside the Earth's core. So it actually is possible if you know this particular structure of the field BD to uniquely reconstruct chi and the direction B. So you cannot reconstruct BD in general, but if you have this particular structure, you get some certain uniqueness for the direction as well as for the susceptibility. Okay, which is sort of quite nice, but even for this uniqueness over here for, this, for the scalar susceptibility, you need the assumption that it is somewhat localized in the subdomain of your of your surface. Okay. So now just one numerical example. 
that we did um, is um, so we had let's say potential field data phi zero this is our potential that we assume to know somewhere outside on this surface sigma and we want to reconstruct our susceptibility chi and we assume to know this uh, magnetic field bd in advance so we want to minimize this uh, data misfit but it's an ill post inverse problem so the operator this uh, potential field operator phi is the compact operator so the inverse is unbounded so this is unstable, so we have to add some regularization term. So in our case, we said we also want to keep the H1 norm of our susceptibility quite small. And we give this some weighting parameter alpha, depending on how much influence we want to put on the data missile and how much influence we want to put on the regularization. And because in order to get uniqueness, we also need to add an additional penalty term penalizing um, the susceptibility chi if it's localized outside our region gamma. So the first penalty term is essentially for the stabilization of the problem. And the second one we add to um, impose this localization constraint to get some sort of uniqueness. Um, and then we inverted this just by well, expanding this chi in terms of some radial basis function and then um, computed the uh, corresponding coefficients, which is not so interesting for now. But these are essentially the results that we got. So um, just some toy example. So you see uh, the upper hemisphere of the, uh, of the globe plotted up here. So this was our data at a, at a sphere outside um, a circle Earth. So this was our potential phi zero. Um, below you see um, the ground truth. So this is the, in some way, anomagnetization that we used to produce this toy example up here. So this is our phi zero. Um, and on the right hand side, you see our reconstructions by minimizing this functional up there. And you see the influence of these parameters alpha beta. So um, up here, the first image you see if you have no penalty terms at all. So if you choose alpha and beta equal to zero, so you don't stabilize and you don't um, impose any localization constraint. You see you get some fancy image, but you see um, your amplitudes of the signal are way higher than they should be. So, okay, that's just due to the instability of the problem. Um, and then if you choose some parameter alpha that uh, includes now a regularization term to keep your H1 norm small, you see that um, you get reasonably large um, values for your reconstruction, but you do not reconstruct actually the magnetization that you put in. Because in this uh, result over here, we did, did not include this localization penalty term. Okay, so because beta was chosen to be zero. Um, and down here, we choose a no, local, no regularization penalty because alpha was zero, but we chose some penalty on the localization. And what you see, you already get quite close to your ground truth, but you have some artifacts over here which just come from this instability of the problem. And so if you add, or if you choose adequate coefficients alpha and beta, including regularization as well as uh, localization penalties, you get a pretty good reconstruction of your, of your ground truth. Of course, these parameters alpha beta, I just was choosing by hand. I mean, that's a general problem in inverse problems to get good coefficients alpha beta. But this was just for illustration that you sort of need to include this localization penalty in order to get a unique re re reconstruction of your, of your ground truth. Okay. And this sort of finishes this section on uniqueness issues for surfaces. I now just want to motivate why we do this next section on what I call data completion problems. Um, over here, let's say we are not having the structure that our magnetization is a scalar function times some known vector field, but we just have one vector field M, which is our magnetization, and we put this in here. So if we now wanted to minimize this functional, we would have to um, reconstruct the H plus, the H minus, 
as well as the divergence free components of M. Although we know that even uh, with this localization constraint, the um, divergence free components cannot be re reconstructed uniquely. So we would sort of reconstruct something that we actually cannot say anything about. So the next, the, the question for the next uh, section is, um, how can we say something about the H minus component from knowledge of the H plus component without having to artificially include a um, divergence free component of our vector field. And I call this the completion problem at the end of the section, you see, you hopefully see why. But uh, the question is now, um, let's say we know the H plus component, so the Hardy space component, uh, the H plus Hardy space component of some vector field F. And we know the underlying vector field is spatially localized. Um, how can we reconstruct the H minus component without having to co-estimate the divergence free contribution? Um, and the other question is, without knowing um, the full vector field that is localized, um, but just knowing the uh, Hardy component in H plus, what uh, conditions does this Hardy component in H plus have to guarantee in the first place or have to satisfy in the first place in order to guarantee that this H plus component can be um, continued by an H minus component in the diversion, the diversion free field to something that is um, spatially localized. So the question is, if we just know this component, how can we check if this actually belongs to some uh, spatially localized vector field? And what this theorem tells us is um, a function in the, play, uh, in the Hardy space H plus can be continued to something that is uh, localized in some subdomain gamma of the sphere, if and only if it is in this subdomain of our Hardy space H plus. And um, this subdomain is exactly characterized um, by these spaces up here, which look a bit, bit ugly, but uh, in fact, they are not so much. Um, so we look at this subspace of L2 gamma, which consists of all L2 vector fields that are localized, uh, sorry, not L2 vector fields, but L2 scalar L2 fields that are localized in our subdomain gamma, plus something of this form, which again includes our double layer potential, our single layer potential, some inverse of the Laplace Beltrami. And um, this applied to the space of H minus functions that are localized in the subdomain gamma and that have a zero mean. So this looks a bit unnecessarily complicated because all this space here says is we look at those functions whose Laplacian vanishes outside of, uh, outside of gamma. So that's just the parameterization of uh, this space. But um, our eventual goal is not for this particular paper that we are about to finish, but like in the long run is to get a good parameterization of this space, which allows continuation. And this can be done by this Characterization because for the L2, uh, for functions localized in gamma in L2 or in H minus, you have like nice radial basis functions that are, that are sort of localized, which you could use to uh, define the subspace of your Hardy space that are sort of allowing this continuation property. So this is uh, the whole reason why we do it. Um, okay, so now we know what the subspace of the Hardy space looks like that allows this continuation to something that's localized within a region, within a region gamma. Um, the problem is that uh, one can show that this space is dense in the full Hardy space. Um, the density itself is not the problem. The problem is that this space up here is not, uh, not closed which essentially tells you that the operator that maps between this subspace H gamma plus and the corresponding Hardy space H minus will be an unbounded operator. 
um, which is not surprising because we have some of this comes from this harmonic continu continuation of the um, magnetic potential. But well, if you stay on, on the surface, um, this unboundedness essentially comes from the from this space not being closed. Okay. Um, and since I'm a bit short on time, I will uh, skip the idea of the proof, but in the end, it just, it just relies on these operators B I star and B O star from before. And we just have to combine them adequately to end up with this system of equations on, on the uh, complement of our subregion gamma. And rearranging this, we actually come up with this uh, spaces from the slide before. Um, okay. But so that was the first result here to characterize those functions that can be continued. The second one is um, if I now know that my function is in this subspace H gamma plus <clears throat> that allows continuation, how can I compute the corresponding um, vector field in H gamma, uh, in H minus? Um, that leads to this continuation without taking this detour by co-estimating a divergence free field as we did before for this numerical example. Um, and this operator is exactly, exactly the operator that we have up here. So if we know our F plus component, it is in the proper subspace uh, of H plus, then this somewhat ugly operator maps into the corresponding um, subspace of H minus to give us the function that we want in order to get this um, spatially localized continuation in this uh, H minus Hardy space. So we don't need to know anything about the divergence free component of F in this case. And while the operator looks a bit ugly, it's not really that bad. All these layer potentials can be computed quite easily. The only problem is this operator up here. You want to invert the layer potential, but together with this projection, of this cutoff onto uh, the complement of our domain gamma. And that's what makes this operator ugly to evaluate, essentially because this projection is included before we need to invert. Um, otherwise, everything else can be computed quite easily. Um, okay, so how can we circumvent having to evaluate an operator like this? Um, we can re reformulate this process in terms of classical Cauchy Laplace problems. Um, and these Cauchy Laplace problems are sometimes also called data completion problems. And that's why I sort of named this section this way. So, our original question on how to continue a vector field to something spatially localized can be reformulated in this way find a Hardy function in the uh, space H plus that coincides with the tangential gradient of um, my function F plus that I can reconstruct from my magnetic field. But this um, equality only holds for a subdomain of the sphere or has only has to hold for a subdomain of the sphere. Okay, so here on the right hand side, we have something that's generally not in a Hardy space, but you try to find um, some function in the Hardy space H plus that is equal to this, at least on a subdomain of the, of the sphere. And these problems are quite well studied and there are also some, some numerics for this um, because this is called data completion because you only have data on a subdomain but you want to find some Hardy function in the entire space. Okay, and the nice thing is once you have solved this problem, then from this we can obtain our function F minus in the Hardy space H minus that we're actually interested in. So, um, and here it also looks lengthy, but the nice thing over here is we don't have any projections anymore involved in the evaluation of this operator. So if we go back two slides here, we had to evaluate this operator, which made some problems because it has this projection in between. Here we don't have this problem anymore, simply because we somewhat have hidden this projection somewhere in this problem over here. And this one is quite well studied in in several, several other papers. So this is our hope to sort of like um, 
find some numerical way of reconstructing this F minus by falling back on some problems like this. Um, and this con uh, data computation problem up here is essentially nothing else than solving a classical Cauchy Laplace problem. So we're looking for some harmonic function in the ball, which has uh, zero Neumann boundary values on the subdomain and whose, uh, oops, whose directly boundary values coincide with the data that we can, uh, with the magnetization that we can reconstruct from our data outside of the sphere. Um, just one interesting issue in this case is um, that this, equal, this equivalence between this data completion problem and our continuation problem from over here seems to hold only on the sphere. At least uh, we didn't know how to, uh, to show this for general surfaces, for general Lipschitz surfaces. So um, we are fairly sure that something like this over here can also be formulated for, for Lipschitz surfaces. But if we trans want to transfer this um, continuation problem to like a Cauchy Laplace problem, at least in our setup, we get some problem because we need to rely on this equality between the double layer potentials and the Laplace Beltrami and the single layer potentials, which only holds on the sphere because this one here only holds if the corresponding uh, Hardy space orthogonal. And that we know is only true for the sphere and for no other surfaces. So at least our arguments only work on the sphere if we want to have this relation between the um, continuation problem that we are looking at and these Cauchy Laplace problems. Okay, but for this first paper, we're only interested in the, in the sphere. And this is essentially finished, and we hope to submit it sometime soon which will be part of Huang's uh, PhD thesis. Okay, um, so I'm still a bit behind schedule. Uh, how much longer do I have, Armin? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Perfect. Then I skip this a section over here and just show some images from geophysics. Um, this would now be the case for uniqueness issues for volumes, which I now skip a bit. I just want to mention maybe this one result over here that you get from this um, something that's inter of interest to geophysicists is not necessarily just reconstructing the whole magnetization, but reconstructing the depth of magnetization. So we don't, they don't really care necessarily about the precise magnetization, but how deep is the deepest magnetization? That is, um, at what depth does magnetization cease to exist? And essentially, the result from, from us here is, uh, well, you cannot say anything about the depth if you have no additional geophysical assumptions. This is what you can, can show from the results from before. But um, OK, so I skip this uniqueness parts and just come to sort of the images. Um, there would be, OK, I just skip this. Um, and so this is uh, the, the first bit that I show is nothing from us, but for, uh, something from the paper of uh, Dave Gubbins and, and colleagues. Um, they came up with a magnetization model for the Earth, which is just based on, let's say, geological data, geological intuition, um, but not really on uh, magnetic field data. So this is the magnetic field model they came up with. You can split this into the Hardy space components. So this is the component in H plus, which is the, this is the component in H minus and the divergence free part. And what our, our results from before tell us, if you know magnetic field data or measurements, all you can reconstruct is this part over here, unless you make some additional assumptions. Um, so this would be the true magnetization coming from some geological um, researchers, but if we just have measurements, we cannot reconstruct anything else but, but this part over here. Um, and what you see if you do like forward computations, this is a magnetic field that one can obtain from satellite data. And this is the magnetic field you would obtain from, from this model that they came up with. And you see there are some, some areas where they coincide quite well and some areas where they don't coincide at all. So including some additional constraints that are maybe mathematically motivated and geophysically motivated might 
help to sort of better fit uh, the forward models with the actual measured magnetic field data. And uh, another example, which is now concerning this depth part that I mentioned, um, is um, something that, as I said before, I mean, typically you cannot say anything about the depth unless you make any additional assumptions. And some assumptions that geophysicists make is you assume your magnetization to be self-similar. So you know that the Fourier um, transfer of your magnetization can be described by essentially two parameters, some multiplicative, multiplicative constant and some fractal parameter describing the decay in, in Fourier domain. So you, so you reduce your vector field to two constant parameters. And if you make that assumption on the magnetic field, you can come up with the corresponding power spectrum of your magnetic potential. And this you can invert from the data in order to get the depth ZB of your um, magnetization. I mean, there's like a lot of sketchy simplifications made in between, but that's sort of what, the, what, is, what is currently done in, in geophysical applications. Um, in order to circumvent this problem of not being able to say anything about the depth unless you make any additional assumptions. And this is uh, sort of some recent paper of us where we used this sort of approach. Um, this was our data. So this is the magnetic field anomaly over Southern Africa and that we wanted to invert for the depth of the magnetization. And here in the top, you essentially see the results that we got. So it shows three different parameters, three different fractal parameters describing uh, the self-similarity of the magnetization. And what you see is, well, uh, depending on what uh, fractal parameter you choose, you get, well, quite arbitrarily different results. So, I mean, the main features are still sort of like uh, maintained. So there is apparently some um, region over here where the uh, magnetic mag magnetized crust is uh, thinner. And then this blue area where the crust seems to be thicker or the magnetization goes deep into the earth. But like the actual quantitative values, they're very strongly and which beta you choose is essentially up to your personal liking or how well the outcome fits uh, the geological uh, prior knowledge, let's say, or prior assumption that you want to make or how well they fit um, your personal liking. So you can see certain structures even with these very crude assumptions, but you see you can make a lot of assumptions that uh, lead to very different models of your magnetization depth. So consolidating this with some more theoretical results would be sort of uh, some, some future goal or this, although this is, um, well, not quite clear how to do that yet. Okay. And this is where I want to finish. So thanks for, for listening. And here you just have uh, the literature. So this is essentially the three papers I talked about, or well, actually this one here I skipped and the other two, are, two ones are the ones I talked about. Yeah, and this is just the sort of list of, of literature. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.